do traditional hunting. Some of you guys might be vegetarians and might not agree with it, but we do hunting. Um, we've always done hunting. In order to be like Dene, that's a part of your life. You had to be a hunter. You had to be a trapper. But there's this crazy rising trend happening right now that we're seeing more and more of. And when you, we, we kill a moose and we go hunting around the area of like Fort McMurray, which is located like 50 kilometers south of the tar sands, we're finding moose, cutting them open, and finding a whole bunch of sores on their bodies. Since uh, June 21st, 1899, we've had federally protected rights to hunt and fish. But what does that mean that the things that we're hunting and eating are killing us? Silently. There is a rare kind of cancer that we're having. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's got this crazy acronym, BL. It's like bile duct something cancer. You get it. Uh, with medical treatment, you can last up to three months. Without medical treatment, you're dead within a month. It, it kind of, the cancer rate's so bad that uh, my buddy Lionel Lapini, his neighbor's dog actually got sick and they, you know, got to check it out. They had to put it down because they found all these cancerous tumors within the dog. Basically what it is, is an environmental holocaust. It's a destruction of everything. They, they clear cut mass sections of land. For every barrel of oil, they've got to dig up five tons of earth. For every barrel of oil, it's between two to four barrels of fresh water that has to be used just to produce one barrel of oil. And it's not like we don't have, we're running out of fresh water throughout Canada. Um, we're polluting, oh, and then there's a process, because oil up there doesn't come as just like oil. We don't drill into the ground and find oil and extract it. It's actually um, stuck within these things called tar sands. They have to heat it up, they boil it, and then they extract the oil from it. They use coal to heat it up. Uh, it's, very, it's a very energy intensive process. But while they're doing it, they're expanding out like this. Why it's coming to that point of direct action is you have to ask yourself, honestly, how many of your own brothers and sisters, you know, your mother, your father, if you have any children, or any of your cousins that you could bury? How many of them could you bury without getting, without getting mad, without getting riled or pissed off? These people are dying right now, and they're dying in vain. And there's, there's no answers. There's no answers being, being brought forth. Uh, in 1982, Mekorot, which was the Israeli national water company, took um, control of all water infrastructure in the territory, and it began to further develop it in order to really support the settlement enterprise. So in this sense, you see sort of um, a series of things. I mean, first of all, of course, the um, development, uh, sort of the limitations to Palestinian water resource development meant that in order to continue both farming and for domestic use, Palestinians became increasingly dependent on the Israeli water system, uh, Mekorot. So on the one hand, you have a creation of dependency, uh, and of course it also means price dependency, people having to purchase this resource which, uh, um, from the Israeli water system. And on the other hand, you really have the establishment of territorial control over the area by developing the water infrastructure, right? So this is just a quote uh, from uh, Ian Selby, who's one of the major people that's done the major research on this issue, and he really notes how essentially through the development of the water network in the West Bank, um, and it must be noted also that Palestinian communities were connected to this network, though generally on their own expenses, um, and also the, the fact of being connected to the network also made them more vulnerable to water cuts, and this is something which is really a problem today as well. Uh, so essentially, these, the West Bank was really drawn into the Israeli infrastructural system. And we see this in water, but we also see this in a lot of other infrastructural systems, for example, roads. So you have sort of, yeah, you have this territorial integration. In 2004, a wall was built around uh, the West Bank, which was declared illegal by the International Court of Justice. And if you look at the course of the wall, you see how it really, it doesn't follow the 1967 uh, the, the 1967 border, the ceasefire line of 1948, but it actually snakes inside the West Bank and it encloses particularly important areas for water resources because particularly in the western aquifer, which is the western part of the mountain aquifer, the most favorable drilling locations are right along the 1948 cease line, ceasefire line. So these, this area is, it was incorporated into Israeli territory. In per capita domestic use, which is household use, residential use, the Palestinians in 2006 had only 37 cubic meter of water per person. The Israelis had 95. 
in agriculture, the Palestinians had 43 cubic meters per person per year. The Israelis had 190. In industry, they had only 3.2 cubic meter per person per year. The Israelis had seven times, 21 million. In total, 83 cubic meter per person per year for the Palestinians versus 310 cubic meter per person for the Israelis. And this is water that rightfully does not belong to them. There is no international agreement. There is no international law that is ruling and determining this unjust allocation of water. It seems to be basically and fundamentally a reflection of the asymmetrical and unbalanced allocation of power. This is the occupier basically denying the occupied the right for return. What really kind of like, screwed us over here was when they put us on the reservations, uh, they forced us to uh, create a dependency um, because our dependency was uh, living in respect with the earth. When they took that away from us, they, we then created a dependency on the government for distribution, um, whether it was for like food or, or money. Um, once, we, once they had that within us, and it, we're going for like three generations now, in order for you to uh, really fully succeed, you have to leave the res. There's nothing on the res. You know, there's nothing there. Um, and I, I see that's being created with your, with your guys' people. And then that, that's, that's very dangerous because they, they take the concept of you growing your own bread to you accepting the crumbs that they place in front of you and being thankful for those crumbs. And then if there's ever uh, people coming up and rising up against it, they offer them a piece of bread. And they take that because they, they're so hungry. Um, that was just, I was thinking about like relations. And uh, I'm just trying to you know, bring that back to you guys. Uh, it, it's, it's a very, very dangerous game that they're playing. It's, a, it's an obvious uh, situation. Uh, I call the uh, developments on the West Bank and Gaza to be path uh, development uh, path dependency. It's purely a dependency theory, all right? And it manifests in a number of ways. Your water for your thirst is dependent on their decisions. Your food now is dependent on whether you grow things or can grow things because they control the water. They also can take the land. They can immediately come and declare this land, and usually the most fertile land, a security zone, and therefore uh, uproot the Palestinian uh, farmers so that food is no longer grown from the ground, but is coming from them. The electricity grid is totally connected and totally uh, supervised and managed by the Israelis. Make a road. All the water pipelines are literally uh, absolutely under the control of the water, uh, Israeli water uh, company. And uh, people talk about the possibility of a global or a water war. Well, 1967 was a water war. I mean, the way the Israelis stopped, they stopped exactly at the borders of where the water uh, origins were.